You write in Manufacturing Consent that it's the primary function of the mass media in the United States to mobilize public support for the special interests that dominate the government and the private sector. What, what are those interests? Well, if you want to understand the way any society works, ours or any other, uh, the first place to look is who makes – who is in a position to make the decisions that determine the way the society functions. Societies differ, but in ours, the major decisions over what happens in the society, decisions over investment and production and distribution and so on, are in the hands of a relatively concentrated network of major corporations and conglomerates and investment firms and so on. They are also the ones who staff the – major executive positions in the government, and they're the ones who own the media, and they're the ones who have to be in a position to make the decisions. They have an overwhelmingly dominant role in the way life happens, you know, what's done in the society. Within the economic system, by law and in principle, they dominate. The control of our resources and the need to satisfy their interests imposes very sharp constraints on the political system and uh, the ideological system. When we talk about manufacturing of consent, whose consent is being manufactured? We, we can, to start with, there are two different groups. We can get more into more detail. But at the first level of approximation, there's two targets for propaganda. One is what's sometimes called the political class. There's maybe 20 percent of the population, which is relatively educated, more or less articulate, uh, that plays some kind of role in decision making. Uh, they're supposed to sort of participate in social life, either as managers or cultural managers, like, say, teachers and writers and so on. They're supposed to vote. They're supposed to play some role in the way economic and political and cultural life goes on. Now, their consent is crucial. It's one group that has to be deeply indoctrinated. Then there's maybe 80 percent of the population uh, whose main function is to follow orders and not to think you know, and not to pay attention to anything. And they're the ones who usually pay the cost. All right, Professor Chomsky, no. Um, you outlined a model with filters that propaganda is uh, sent through. That's way to the public. Can you briefly outline those? It's basically an institutional analysis of the major media, what we call a propaganda model. We're talking primarily about the national media, those media that sort of set a general agenda that others more or less adhere to, to the extent that they even pay much attention to uh, national or international affairs. Now, the elite media are the sort of the agenda-setting media. That means the New York Times, the Washington Post, the major television channels, and so on. They set the general framework. The local media more or less adapt to their structure. World News. It can sound like it says that there's a beachhead. I think, I think, I think 628 is a good one. Yeah, but I think, I think, I think 6 is a good start. This is the operative sound bite for us. He's, he's out. He's he really knows how to time. He's got a minute for all the time, so that's... I love this sound bite. It's very well. And they do this in all sorts of ways, by selection of topics, by distribution of concerns, by emphasis and framing of issues, by filtering of information, by bounding of debate within certain limits. Two and a half minutes to air. 45 seconds. They determine, they select, they shape, they control, they restrict uh, in order to serve the interests of dominant elite groups in the society. There is an unusual amount of attention focused today on the five nations of Central America. This is Democracy's Diary. Here, for our instruction, are triumphs and disasters, the pattern of life's changing fabric. Here is great journalism, a revelation of the past, a guide to the present, and a clue to the future. The New York Times is certainly the most important newspaper in the United States, and one could argue the most important newspaper in the world. Uh, the New York Times plays an enormous role in shaping the perception of the current world on the part of the politically active, educated classes. Also, the New York Times has a special role and I believe its editors probably feel that they bear a heavy burden in the sense that the New York Times creates history. What happened years ago may have a bearing on what happens tomorrow. Millions of clippings are preserved in the Times Library, all indexed for instant use, a priceless archive of events and the men who make them. 
That is, history is what appears in the New York Times archives. The place where people will go to find out what happened is the New York Times. Therefore, it's extremely important if history is going to be shaped in an appropriate way, that certain things appear, certain things not appear, certain questions be asked, other questions be ignored, uh, and that issues be framed in a particular fashion. Now, in whose interests uh, is the history being so shaped? Well, I think that's not very difficult to answer. Now, to eliminate confusion, all of this has nothing to do with liberal or conservative bias. According to the propaganda model, both liberal and conservative wings of the media, whatever those terms are supposed to mean, fall within the same framework of assumptions. Uh, in fact, if the system functions well, it ought to have a liberal bias, or at least appear to, because if it appears to have a liberal bias, that will serve to balance thought even more effectively. In other words, if the press is indeed adversarial and liberal and all these bad things, then how can I go beyond it? They're already so extreme in their opposition to power that to go beyond it would be to take off from the planet. So therefore, it must be that the presuppositions that are accepted in the liberal media are sacrosanct, can't go beyond them. Uh, and a well-functioning system would, in fact, have a bias of that kind. The media would then serve to say, in effect, thus far and no further. Uh, we, we ask, what would you expect of those media on just very, relatively uncontroversial guided free market assumptions? And when you look at them, you find a number of major factors uh, entering into determining what their products are. Uh, these are what we call the filters. So one of them, for example, is ownership. Who owns them? The major agenda-setting media, after all, what are they? As institutions in the society, what are they? Well, in the first place, they are major corporations, in fact, huge corporations. Uh, furthermore, they're integrated with and sometimes owned by even larger corporations, conglomerates. So, for example, by Westinghouse and GE and so on. What I wanted to know was how specifically the elites control the media. What I mean is, I guess... It's like asking, how do the elites control General Motors? Well, why isn't that a question? I mean, General Motors is an institution of the elites. They don't have to control it. They own it. So what we have in the first place is major corporations, which are parts of even bigger conglomerates. Now, like any other corporation, they, they have a product which they sell to a market. Uh, the market is advertisers, that is, other businesses. What keeps the media functioning is not the audience. They make money from their advertisers. And remember, we're talking about the elite media, so they're trying to sell uh, a good product, a product which raises advertising rates. And ask your friends in the advertising industry, that means that they want to mo adjust their audience to the more elite and affluent audience that raises advertising rates. So what you have is institutions, corporations, big corporations, that are selling relatively privileged audiences to other businesses. Well, what point of view would you expect to come out of this? I mean, without any further assumptions, what you'd predict is that what comes out is a picture of the world, a perception of the world, that satisfies the needs and the interests and the perceptions uh, of the sellers, the buyers, and the product. Now, there are many other factors that press in the same direction. If people try to enter the system who don't have that point of view, they're likely to be excluded somewhere along the way. After all, no institution is going to happily design a mechanism to self-destruct. It's not the way institutions function. So they all work to exclude or marginalize or eliminate dissenting voices or alternative perspectives and so on because they're dysfunctional. They're dysfunctional to the institution itself. 